Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I want to tell you it's a, quite a privilege to stand in front of a group of men who are brave enough to at least want to serve God. I say that because we live in a culture that's consumed with another passion, that knows little of the desire to even acknowledge God, let alone serve Him. And it is my hope that after we are done together tonight, that your desire to know, love, and serve God will be increased and your resolve to do the same will be deepened. Today we live in a culture that practically at every turn either offers excuses for why men are no longer men or assaults anything that pretends or hopes to be manly. But if we are to be men of God, that's what we must be. Men of God. Notice I did not say women of God. If I were invited to the women's club, this would be a different talk, and you would have a different focus, and I would be saying to them, you are called to be women of God, which is not the same as being called to be men of God. Which gets at another theme that's constant in our culture, and that is the notion that somehow manliness and womanliness really matters not. That somehow there's a generic way to, to be human. There is no generic way to be human. You will either be a man who is born and created by God to be such, and you know it because of your biology, or you were created to be a woman. And you have decidedly different traits in your body that reveals who God has made you to be. Tonight, I want to talk to you about Advent and masculine spirituality. I subtitled this talk, Toward a Manly Hope. And I mean that. This is not a generic talk about being godly. This is a talk that has as its focus and its goal being godly men. Dear brothers, every time the holy sacrifice of the Mass is offered, the priest prays something like the following. It is meet, right, and now bound in duty, always and everywhere to give thanks unto Thee. O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God. That's the ordinary form of the Roman Rites prayer that follows immediately or shares in the preface that is prayed during every holy sacrifice of the Mass. And in this prayer, we acknowledge, and the priest acknowledges for the people of God, male and female, he acknowledges to the people of God and says to God on our behalf, he says that it is fitting that me... <coughs> It is right, that means it's just or appropriate. And it is our bounden 
duty. Now, duty is not a word we hear much about anymore. We hear lots about freedom and almost never about duty. But if we are to be truly free, according to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we must forever banish from our minds the centrality that freedom has gained in our hearts. We do not exist to be free because we are creatures. We exist to give to someone else, that is the living God, our Holy Father, our Lord, the everlasting God who is, is without limit in His power. We are bound and obligated to give Him His due, which is the entirety of our life offered to Him always and everywhere. There is no place from which we can escape this bounden duty. We cannot go into a private den in our home and turn on a big flat screen and find a haven away from this duty. <coughs> we cannot gather around an island anywhere proximate to our kitchen and be free of this duty. When we get in our cars and we make our way into the city or wherever you go to your place of employment, you do not arrive at a place from which you are free or at which you are free from this duty. In fact, even the, the drive you took from wherever you live to wherever you work, even then this duty applies. It is the nature of being a creature to owe this duty to the Creator. We do not, we are not men in our own right. We are men who stand before the living God. And the day that we come to a rich appreciation of that is the day that we will begin to stand and I mean really stand. We will be able to square our shoulders and steal our backs and say yes to every command of the Creator. And not only will we do it, we will do it with great joy in a spirit of thankfulness. That's all in that preface, you know. And we, we have it prayed for us every single time we come to Holy Mass. Tonight, it is my purpose to speak to you, or with you, might be a better way to describe it, about the scope and shape of this joyful duty. In this moment, I do not speak first as a priest, although I cannot help but speak as a priest. I speak first as a man, a servant of God, one who in the labor of baptism was raised from the death of the sonship of Adam into the life of, the, of God himself. That experience, which happened for most of you when you were not conscious, for me, it happened when I was 10 because I was a part of a tradition that did not honor the command of Christ to offer their children first, even before they entered, attained to the age of reason. So I was conscious when it happened to me. But whether you're conscious or unconscious, the duty applies because in our baptisms we were raised to a different kind of life. 
We may repudiate this life, but we are still obligated by it. We may be embarrassed by this life, but we are still obligated to it. <coughs> we may chide our parents and insult them under our breath because they dared to do this to us, but we are still obligated. We were made sons of God by God. In the freedom that he has as our sovereign Lord and in delivering us from the bondage of death in the waters of baptism and then strengthening the life that he infused in us in our baptisms through the sacrament of confirmation he made us ready to be his sons manly sons but specifically, specifically, I wish to speak to you about four virtues. <coughs> four virtues that are essential to a manly spirituality. And if we cultivate these, it will change our life forever. I want to say something up front. I'm not assuming that you have practiced any of these virtues. <laughs> That's not a requirement. <clears throat> so if in the course of this talk, your conscience is pricked, and you begin to feel guilt, give thanks to God, which is your bounden duty, and then go to confession. Don't waste your time. Satan would have you transform what, in that moment, is actually a kind of godly sorrow intended to lead you to new life or better life, a more manly, godly life. He would wish to have you, seduce you into transforming that into just feeling bad. And that would be an enormous loss of grace for you, as it would be for me. When I speak to you about these virtues, I'm not talking at you. That's why I said I was speaking to you first as a man. And I happen to be, oddly enough, both a priest and a married man. And so I know, experientially, the failures of these virtues within the context that most of you will have to live them out. In the course of this talk, I may tell stories. If I do, they are going to come from my experience with my own father or with my own children. The purpose of that is not to really highlight those things, like say, look at me, but really to offer to you at least one concrete way, example of how somebody was trying to live this today. Okay? Those virtues are reverence, humility, consideration, and courage. These four virtues are not all the virtues that are called forth by the priestly prayer that we witness and hear every Sunday and every day if we have the good fortune to go to Mass daily. But I offer them as a kind of starting place. Imagine yourself at the beginning of a race and you have put on your spikes if they are whatever the runners call those things that have like grippy things, you know, those things. You put on those shoes, right? And you bow your knees, or bend them, actually, and you get your hamstrings ready, and you carefully place them in the blocks. You might call these the blocks of a manly spirituality. The fear of God. In the book of the Proverbs, mainly composed by Solomon under the inspiration of God, which is a unique form of literature. Imagine this across many cultures. 
pro proverbs were used to instill in generation after generation the, the wisdom acquired by the ancients. And they were crafted in a way that they were pithy so that you would remember them. That's why we call them proverbs. And you ought to get into the habit of learning them, memorizing them, reciting them to your children, echoing them in your head as you drive into work and some person you are tempted to call an idiot um, suddenly appeared before you after almost taking your front bumper with him. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Solomon says. Put another way, God says through Solomon. But the foolish despise knowledge and instruction. Often today, brothers, presentations that take up what used to be a help, presentations on the fear of God used often take up what used to be a helpful distinction. They would say to men, right, they would say, when the scriptures speak of fearing God, it is not speaking of a servile fear, but rather a filial fear. Now, that distinction is true enough. It is important. It is absolutely essential. But we come at this text, this proverb, with a deficit, an enormous deficit. In fact, you could call it a lacuna, an absence. We don't have a context in which to understand the implications of that distinction. So it falls into meaninglessness for us. The context in which we live is, a f is foreign to the notion of filial fear, which is the fear of, that a son has of disappointing his father, of not arising to maturity as a man. And he fears this, not because his dad has a rod. Now, his dad in the past had a rod, and we should take them up, but that's a whole nother talk, <laughs> right? He used to have a rod, but the purpose of that rod was not to instill servile fear, but to instill and develop in his son <clears throat> filial fear. This is why the abuse of men against their children is so terrible, because it subverts the whole purpose of fatherhood which is to instill and develop in sons and daughters filial fear, the experience of being saddened by the knowledge that something you have done, some thought you have, pa you have entertained, some emotion you have nurtured would dishonor him, would, would bring disrepute to his name, would cause scandal in the slightest way. This is the real terrible loss of the abuse of children by their fathers. Because that means now, this child who's been abused by his father has, been, has had set in his heart a confusion. And now he thinks that servile fear <coughs> is really the same thing as the fear of God. When I was a little boy, I was nine years old, my grandfather came to live with us, and I did not know this, but by the time I was in my early teens, he began to pray for me. We were de I was be being raised in a devout evangelical Christian home, but somehow, by the grace of God, my Papa Tracy thought he saw, or... I, that's how I put it, but he would put it. He knew, he saw, that God had called me to be a priest. And so he began to pray that God would give me the courage to disappoint my father.
See, he knew that my dad had cultivated in me filial fear, which is a virtue. And he knew the most difficult challenge I would face in answering the call to my vocation would not be a vice, it would be a virtue. Today we speak of God's love so often that we have become <coughs> incapable of understanding the experience of filial fear. Most of us are not even aggrieved by mortal sins anymore. We think there are little things or big things that we can just get off our chests when we go to confession. And because we have such a muted understanding of how profoundly disappointed our Heavenly Father is when we commit grievous sins against His Majesty and His honor, we receive less grace in the very sacrament that He has offered to, to lavish that grace upon us. And we are so accustomed to hearing about the love of God that venial sins don't even occur to us. And we just glibly say, yeah, doesn't the church teach that if you go to Holy Mass, venial sins are covered? And we are right. Theologically, we are right. But we miss the whole point. That's not a pass on venial sins. It's a kindness given by a Father who loves us. It is a fearful thing, St. Paul writes, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. <coughs> brothers, and, brothers in Christ, I want to say to you that the man who does not fear God will not worship Him. Neither will he obey or love Him. Then comes the virtue of consideration. I subtitle this section, Living with and Leading Our Wives and Children. Listen to these words from the sacred scriptures. Likewise, you husbands, live considerately with your wives, bestowing honor on the woman as a weaker sex. If we even think these thoughts, all the commercials we've seen, all of the, <coughs> the madness that this culture parades before our eyes as wisdom and equality, if we even dreamt this, we would be awakened from our sleep and say, Whoa, what was that? <laughs> but this is what it says. And if we are to be virtuous men, if we are to be men who practice and embody the virtue of consideration, we have to own what God says about our wives, whether they like it or not whether no voice in the culture accepts it or not, God has said to us, by the Holy Ghost, through the first Roman pontiff, that your wife is a weaker vessel. Therefore, I must live, I must order my life in such a way that I ensure that at every moment, at every, in every place, and every situation, I so live with my wife that in the action and in the thought and in the movement of my affections, I honor her as a weaker vessel. Since you are joint heirs of the grace of life. In order, and to catch the motive, the reason you should do this is because we are both joint heirs. 
in order that your prayers may not be hindered. Brothers, it's not a mystery why when we pray, nothing happens. Or virtually nothing. Just look at how we behave with our wives. God has said, if we do not live with our wives practicing the virtue of consideration, it will impair, if not impede, the effective power of our prayers. Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love of the brethren, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not return evil for evil, or reviling for reviling. In other words, when your wife has lost her stuff, you must not, likewise, lose yours. But on the contrary, when we experience evil and reviling, even from the lips of our wives, we are to bless. We are to bless. For to this you have been called, that you may obtain a blessing. You ever wondered why you ain't getting blessed? There's your answer. For he that would love life, catch us now, the apostle is appealing to us. The Roman pontiff is appealing to us. For he that would love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. No matter what the provocation, there is no justification for the loss of control of one's tongue. This is how one lives considerately. Let him turn away from evil and do good, do right. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Brothers, do not be deceived. You cannot live this way if you have not mastered the one part of our masculinity that our culture at every turn begs us, pleads with us, pays us to do, to let loose. The man who does not master his sensual desires will be impaired in his efforts to nurture the respect of his wife. We don't want to admit this, right? But when we are driven, when we say in our minds, I have to, that I have to give expression to this, notice the language, have to, what we are confessing is that we have chosen not to master our bodies. But the Apostle Paul, echoing the same profound insight that the first Roman pontiff did in application to wives, is now going to apply this to fathers. <clears throat> Peter has spoken to us, blessed Peter has spoken to us about how we are to live considerately with our wives. The Apostle Paul is now going to speak to us how to practice the virtue of consideration with regard to our children. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Who can do this save a man who has mastered himself? When I was <coughs> newly a father, and Michael was of age to have his 
Heine whipped, okay, with a tamarind switch, which was the custom in the Bahamas, which I actually never used because I really didn't enjoy a tamarind switch when I was a boy. But anyway, after a few months, Michael probably was about five at the time, I know it occurred to me that no matter what the offense that he had committed, I always stopped at the third spanking. Meaning, if he had done something that was mild, something, some little offense, I would take him by the hand, I would hold his hand, and I would... If he had done something more grievous, same thing. Three times and nothing. If he had done something terrible or dangerous, same thing. Three times and no more. Never four. So I asked my dad one time, I said, Dad, you know, this is really weird. And I, can you explain this to me? And I told him what I just told you. And he looked at me and he smiled. He said, Oh, that's easy. I never spied to you more than three times. My father's mastery of his own emotions, of his own anger, embarrassment, or whatever, was rooted in me in a way that controlled my behavior even when I did not know it. Brethren, that's how you live the virtue of consideration. The third virtue, humility. And what I want to say to you is difficult to say. It's not difficult because the words are complicated. But if you ponder it, you will begin to feel its weight. The man who does not govern himself will find it near impossible to govern his children. <coughs> and the first place we learn the governance of self is with the virtue of humility. Humility is the virtue by which a person, considering his own defects, has a lowly opinion of himself and will willingly submits himself to God and to others for the sake of God. This is a person that St. Bernard would say possesses a virtue by which a man, knowing himself as he truly is, abases himself. Similarly, this humility, properly understood, means that we take ownership of our defects. We actually acknowledge them, contrary to the way Microsoft has programmed the word, word processing application, or that Apple has done their pages application, where if you put in a passive form of a verb, if you try your hardest, to give expression to the virtue of humility in writing, it'll correct you. It'll say, that's the <laughs> passive voice. Not supposed to be using the passive voice. In American college, Christian college, no doubt, I was forbidden to use the passive voice. Humility demands that I use the passive voice, that I acknowledge my own weaknesses. Anyone who's worked with me know I am an administrator's worst nightmare. I'm not kidding. Like, you do not want to administrate me. Okay? Because 
really important things like turning in your timesheet and showing up for lunch at 12 o'clock and not 12.05 and stuff like that. I know they're really important, right? But if you knew how many machinations I have to go through to make that happen, you'd understand what I mean when I say to you, I bow the knee to administrators. They are possessed of a gift that I think must come from God, so absent as it is within me. Brethren, the humble man knows both his strengths and his weaknesses, his offenses and negligences, and does not preen around like a peacock, no matter what the world tells you. The reason is, every good and perfect gift that we have is just that, a gift. A gift intended by God to be honored in our life and to be given in service back to Him and to the ones entrusted to our care. Finally, courage. And I hope you take this one to heart, because we have been seduced as Catholic men in a way that I think sometimes we give ourselves, ourselves excuses and we actually believe them. Notice, I don't mean like we make them up. We actually believe this excuse, okay? When we say, when we give witness to the constancy and pervasiveness of wickedness in our culture. <clears throat> we give ourselves a pass on courage. In the sacred scriptures, Genesis chapter 6, we're told this story. By the way, by story, I don't mean an untrue tale. I just mean this is what happened and it's crafted as a story. And God, seeing that the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and that all the thought of the heart was bent on evil at all times, it repented him that he had even made man on the earth. And being touched inwardly with sorrow of heart, he said, this is now God giving us insights into his own interior deliberations. I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, from man even to beast, from the creeping thing even to the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Does that sound familiar to you? Does that not sound like the culture in which we live? When you look around, it is constant. I wish I could tell you, just drive down Lake, West Lake Street and you could have a half block free of some assault on, on goodness. You can't. You can't even get from this church to that gas station without seeing something that's an assault on you. And this is a safe place. <clears throat> When's the last time you turned on the TV and got through 15 minutes without, in some way, being offered a seduction to one of the virtues. So we live, in a profound sense, in the day Noah was living in. But listen to this next statement. After God has described the horrific, pervasive character of the evil of humanity, that's everywhere present, the scriptures bear witness to this. Within that context, it says, but Noah found grace before the Lord. 
How did he do it? <coughs> Courage. Courage is the virtue that allows us to not succumb to fear. It does not remove fear. It does not remove the reasonable expectation of harm. But it creates a resolve in a man that he will not succumb. He will not back down. He will stand his ground. He will steal his back. He will square his shoulders and he will face whatever he must face in order to hear God describe him the way God described Noah. Brothers, more than anything else, your sons and your daughters need you to be courageously virtuous. <coughs> more than anything else, your wife needs you to have enough courage that you will lead her. More than anything else, You need the courage to be humble. More than anything else, you need, dear brethren, the fear of God. Which strengthens courage. When I was about, I told you the first part of that story, you know, my grandfather praying for me. He started praying for me apparently when I was in maybe 13. In 1997, I was 35 when I submitted to ordination as an Anglican priest, which led to my ordination as a Catholic priest. My grandfather prayed for most of those years, but he died about five years before my ordination. He prayed, really what he prayed for is that I would fear God more than I would fear my father. And I mean filial fear. My dad and I, or my dad, parted ways from me the moment he became concretely aware that I was going to become an Anglican priest because he actually knew I was going to become a Catholic. <laughs> he told my siblings that, said, don't listen to Vaughan. Vaughan says he's becoming an Anglican. Don't pay no mind. Read this book. He sent them each copies of Father John Hardin's a Catholic catechism. He says, if you want to know what Vaughn actually believes, read this book. Just ignore him. He was right. And we were never reconciled, or we were not reconciled, from that moment until two months before my father entered into dementia. By the grace of God, I was invited to give a series of talks, the, ad, ad, the Lenten <coughs> mission of the Archdiocese of Nassau. And almost when I was, immediately when I received the invitation, God said to me, I don't mean like I heard a voice, you know what I mean. <laughs> he made a profound impression upon me that when I get to Nassau, I must see my father. And immediately I heard my own interior voice say, what's the use? Since 1996, I have been pursuing my father. And God said, who cares? Did you not catch what I said? 
So the last day, the last few hours, literally, as I'm going to the airport to fly out of the Bahamas, I go to visit my dad. I have no idea what I'm going to say to my dad. But this is part of what I said to him. I believe God spoke. I said, Dad, I chose to disappoint you because you taught me when I was a boy if you must disappoint someone, never disappoint God. My dad reached out to me and did something he had not done since 1996. With the very little strength that he had remaining, he grabbed my hand and my arm and he did not let go for the next 10 minutes. He probably exhausted by the time he was done. I was exhausted by the time he was done. And he said these words to me because I had offered my apologies, my, I begged him to forgive me for all the ways that I had disappointed him. He said, Vaughn, everything you say to me, I say to you. Brethren, we are not called to be boys. We're not. We're called to be men. And it's going to take reverence. It's going to take the virtue of consideration. It's going to take, yes, humility. And it's going to take, for sure, I tell you, it's going to take courage. There's a hymn I love, and I hope I can find it. I want to sing it to you. Now that's brave. <laughs> You're stupid. <laughs> Rise up, O men of God, out done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings, to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O men of God, his kingdom tarries long. Bring in the day of brotherhood, and end the night of wrong, end the night of wrong. Rise up, O men of God, the church for you doth wait, sent forth to serve the needs of men. In Christ our strength is great, in Christ our strength is great. Lift high the cross of Christ, tread where his feet has trod, as brothers of the Son of Man. Rise up, O men of God. Rise up, O men of God. Dear friends, if there's one prayer I have for you, and for myself, is that we would be counted among those men rose up and became men of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.